Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll be summarizing uh, the whole day's program, Spine Blocks for Neurosurgeons. And I'll try to emphasize on certain particular blocks which have not been discussed uh, at a greater length. So why should I learn blocks? It helps clinch diagnosis many a times. And especially if we are taking up uh, the patient for surgery. And uh, it is definitely a part of the treatment algorithm. What are the blocks I would be talking about? Uh, erector spiny block. It's a plane block. Transferaminal block we have already discussed in the morning and we have demonstrated it as, as well. Facetal block, that means intrafacetal injections. Then medial branch blocks for facetal pain. Epidural blocks, the various types we have already discussed. Caudal block and SI joint block, uh, they have already been uh, discussed just the previous lecture was on that. So why blocks? Because there is a poor association between imaging and the cause of chronic pain. So that is why the blocks come into place so that we are very sure that what we are targeting, even surgically, we are at the right place. And surprisingly, only in 15% cases, the source of chronic pain can be picked up through imaging alone. So, you know, it is so less. We need to use diagnostic blocks more often. Uh, now, how to go about diagnostic nerve root block? It helps diagnose the source of pain, pinpoints the pain generating root level or the facet joint. You can use lidocaine, which is a short-acting drug, small amount, 0.5 to 1 ml, and if the patient has 50, some studies would say 50%, but generally we agree that 70% is the mark. If the patient has 70% or more pain relief, we consider it to be, the, to be a positive test. The diagnostic value of any diagnostic nerve root block or facet block is only moderate. So clinical imaging as well as the diagnostic nerve root block. Uh, the frequency of blocks that we can give is about three to four per year is safe for a particular level. Uh, and there should be a gap of at least more than two weeks. What are the contraindications? Anticoag, local site infection, systemic infection, pregnancy, use ultrasound only, and if there is allergy to contrast or local anesthetic agents. We have had an extensive discussion on the type of steroid. Again, I would emphasize that I personally believe in dexamethasone. The particle size is 10 times smaller than that of a RBC, and they do not aggregate. So um, dexamethasone is the drug of choice for me, and there is no difference in studies as far as functional or analgesic outcome is concerned between the particulate or the non-particulate steroid. Uh, the rationale for steroid use, I'd like to draw your attention to this epidural steroid versus just bupivacaine injection in disc prolapse. Epidural steroid injection patients, 23% required surgery, whereas just the bupivacaine group required 67%. Uh, so obviously you need to use steroids. Rational for local anesthetic, the viscosity is different. Uh, uh, local anesthetics is uh, uh, similar and there is higher viscosity of the dye. So uh, the dye would spread less and the uh, local anesthetic would spread more than the dye. The volume of drug would decide the specificity. So suppose if you are putting 4 or 5 ml, then obviously there will be extensive spread and you cannot be very sure about the uh, level of the block. And so lower volume for selective nerve root blocks and SI joint or facet blocks and higher volume spreading to adjoining structures and decreases the specificity. Rational of epidural steroid. Now this is, this is very important, the SPORT trial, which is the spine patient outcome research trial. Patients of this herniation receiving epidural steroid, only 20% of them required surgery. Whereas without epidural steroid block, almost 57 to 60% required surgery. 
so sort of we can avoid a lot of discrepancies if we are using uh, the blocks now coming to transfer animal versus interlaminar tf approach has better results lower complications and obviously better ventral penetration of the drug because in this cases and uh, at times with osteophytes uh, or cysts you may have anterior compression and the root is also lying anterior in the foramen so transferamin tends to deposit the drug there in pregnancy kindly use ultrasound now let us compare fluoroscopy versus ct scan now fluoroscopy is faster widely available easy to use better non axial view real time view of the flow of dye and the disadvantage is radiation to the surgeon and obviously uh, non axial views whereas in ct you have excellent axial views uh, and 3d views precise view of where exactly your needle tip is uh, however uh, and also operator radiation is avoided but the disadvantage is time taking increased radiation to the patient and real time views are absent so every time you tend to come out so let's uh, look at erectile spinal pain block it is uh, the new uh, child uh, around the corner it was just started 2016 it's a facial plane block and the drug is deposited below the erector spinal muscles uh, so i personally use for periop pain reduction uh, for my lumbar surgeries as well as if i am doing thoracic surgery uh, however it was introduced for thoracic surgery and for chronic pain uh, so part of it is espb block like for all of us it can it can be utilized as the multimodal analgesia so it is part of the eras program now the target is the tip of the transverse process you can do it fluoroscopic or ultrasound guided the needle rests on the tip of the transverse process below the erector spinal muscle and i personally use 20 ml of uh, i use ropivacaine 0.2% deposited on either side so if i am doing just a endoscopic disc or a tubular disc on one side then obviously i'll just uh, push in the drug on one but suppose if i am doing some sort of fixation i tend to push the drugs on either side uh, now what is the current standing the conclusion is erector spinal block provides less opioid consumption lower pain scores and longer time to first analgesic uh in the perioperative period uh, so obviously if you are using it uh, you can uh, enhance the recovery complications you can have partial lower limb weakness complete motor block priapism local toxicity to the anesthetic drug because you are injecting a lot of it transferamin blocks uh, we have already discussed at length in the morning so i'm not going to that facet uh, i'll uh, uh focus on a few very important aspects which are practical tips 67% of neck pain is secondary to facet especially chronic neck pain 48% of thoracic pain 45% of low back pain i must tell you 10 years before i hardly thought about facet as the source of pain so many patients coming to my clinic and this data sort of opens our eyes to the times we are missing the cause of the pain generator this has already been shown uh, the presentation of facet mediated pain basically it's it's uh, it's a diagnosis of uh, exclusion but the patient can come with lumbar back pain aggravated on hyperextension rotational movements uncommonly it will spread to the lower limbs up to the knee it generally does not go below the knee so you can differentiate with the radicular symptoms uh in cervical uh, professor dureja has already discussed this is the pattern you will get but no uh, radicular pain into the upper limbs in, uh, coming to intraarticular facet blocks so facet as a source of pain basically it's a diagnostic block not very good therapeutic option the causes of facet joint pain can be osteoarthritis rheumatoid arthritis and spawn segmental instability trauma inflammatory post laminectomy and post spinal fusion again i would emphasize that a good number of our patients when we fuse they complain of back pain and we do not 
listen to them we just keep on using analgesic physiotherapy and uh, gabapentins and pregabalins please uh, think about facet as a source and at least do a diagnostic block now as far as intraarticular facet joint block is concerned you need to push in less than 1.5 ml because otherwise there would be capsular rupture or leakage uh, for cervical facet you can use a short acting local anesthetic uh, whereas in lumbar you can go in for a long acting one this we have uh, already we've had so much of discussion since the morning but you can see the facet line here and you just need to push the needle straight in do the die let's uh, look quickly on to the studies uh, i think my time is over so let's skip this medial branch block just one comment uh, so for say l4 5 facet joint so the question is suppose if you have a l4 5 facet joint the supply is coming from one is coming from the l4 ramus and the other is coming from l3 ramus but to simplify l4 5 facet joint you use l4 pedicle area and l5 pedicle area to block okay so that will give you a good median branch block uh to remember these are the exceptions to the dual supply atlanto occipital joint atlanto axial joint and c23 joint they just have singular supply technique has already been discussed the best is between the mammillary process and the accessory process but the midline is good enough because most of the times on fluoroscopy this is not seen complications this i would like to focus multifidus is supplied by medial branch so, and it is very important for stability so avoid more than 3 level median branch block because it will cause innervation and instability this we have already seen in the morning during our session we did interlaminal midline 2 we did one paramedian and transforaminal we did several so this we have already discussed i will not go uh, just the final slide on epidural and anticoagulant consensus and sets no contraindication etropidin discontinue for 14 days before the procedure propidine goes per in 5 days heparin discontinue 2 to 4 hours prior check the ptt and then you can go ahead warfarin discontinue 5 days get the inr normalized low molecular weight wait for 24 hours after the last dose <laughs> so i think i'll uh, uh, sum up my lecture here uh, in the interest of time thank you so much We would like to have some questions. Yes, Any sir. questions to Dr. Sir, uh, because uh, we are talking.